I will be reading from Genesis 3, 1 to 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say we must, uh, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her, her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid, uh, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Uh, but the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Second readings from Matthew chapter 2 verses 13 to 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning there in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. All right, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you this morning, whether you're um, here with us in person or you're online. Uh, it's great to have you here, and I'm going to echo Chris's suggestion. I'm going to say it's lemon too. I don't know. I'm going to call it lemon. But if you've got your lemon handout, uh, it'd be great to have open with you, because uh, he's got the passage on it. Um, it's also got the sermon outline insert there. Uh, that'd be really great for you, uh, for you to follow along. I want to think, uh, just to get us thinking this morning, have you been watching, it could be a sporting thing, it could be a dr drama or something like that, or something on the telly, where you've come across a victory that's seemingly been snatched out of the jaws of defeat. All right, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we have, there's like, there's so many we could think of perhaps to begin with. One that came to mind and because we're in the midst of the Australian Open, that's kind of what this one came to me. In 2012, there we go. In 2012, we had the epic, there's no short of epic, it's definitely epic, um, 
story, uh, Epic's uh, sporting, uh, really, grand final of the Australian Open of Rafael Nadal versus Novak Djokovic. Um, going into the match, though, Novak was the 100% favourite. They're like, you, you ask any commentator, you ask any bookie or whatever, Novak was the favourite. Yeah, Rafa might put up a good fight, maybe, but Novak was the favourite. Um, he was just slated to win from the outset. And it was a really interesting when it came to the final. Uh, maybe that's what it looked like to begin with. Novak started strong. Uh, but then as the, as the, game, as the, <clears throat> as the match went on, uh, Rafa kind of got the ascendancy. Uh, for a long period of time, and it actually looked like for the longest time that Rafa was going to win. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not saying there's no back or Rafa fans in here or whatever, that's, that's up to you. But uh, in the end, Novak in the final set uh, managed to break, it, break um, Rafa's serve and uh, went on to win. The match itself was nearly six hours long. Um, it was the longest and uh, still is the longest in Grand Slam history and certainly in Grand Slam final history. Uh, in fact, it was so long and they were both so tired at the end that in the ceremony, when they presented both the winner and the runner-up trophy, um, which went against tradition, but both Novak and Rafa had to get seats to sit down because they were so tired. Um, most definitely uh, a victory from Snatch, seemingly, from the jaws of defeat. And in the passage we had this morning, I wonder if you got the sense of a victory being snatched from the jaws of defeat. We remember last week where we met two kings, really. We had the clash of two kings. We had King Herod, who seemed to have all the ascendancy. He had all the power. He had all the might. He had all the armies that displayed. And then by contrast, you had baby Jesus. Helpless, seemingly, uh, no real authority as far as anyone kind of who knows people should have. Uh, the only people who came to see him were some Gentile magi, uh, who, but nonetheless they came to worship him. It was fascinating and really this is the second half of that story where we see a uh, what Matthew has been trying to say all along so far is setting up Jesus as God's king. And really, that's what the story of Matthew is about. When we go through Matthew's gospel, it's the picture, painting the picture of Jesus, the true king, and his kingdom. And as we go through today, we're going to see that through his journey in and out of Egypt, God sets up Jesus as the one who will rescue his people from the bondage of sin. So as we get into this uh, today, if you've got your sermon outline there, it would be helpful as we follow along. And the narrative begins with a rescue, uh, God's rescue when they escape down to Egypt. You see that in verse 13. Uh, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to, appeared to Joseph in a dream. Uh, get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So that's what they do. They go off and do that. They stay there until the death of Herod. And we're told something really significant. Because at the, so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Now, could you imagine that just for a moment? Joseph and Mary, tired. <laughs> Mary in particular, tired from maybe recently giving birth. And this family, fairly vulnerable. And yet Herod, with all his kings, the stuff that he has available to him, maybe an army, maybe loyal servants, are sent to try and track this baby down to, not like last week, to so-called worship him, because we know that was now really false, reveals his true intention, because Herod wants to kill him. And you could imagine how the parents uh, would be feeling at that point, incredibly fearful and worried. In fact, they flee, and we're told that they flee to Egypt. Now, roughly where they are, and that's around about 800 k's to Egypt south. Now, I'm not kind of the fittest guy in the room, um, but uh, 800 k's sounds like a long way. 
Um, but you must imagine what they must have, the kind of fear <clears throat> they must have had. But also not only the fear, <clears throat> it's a little bit of an illustration of they were going to trust. Okay, I'm going to trust the Lord, trust the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself in order to go down to Egypt. But it's Matthew setting us up in a particular way here with this fulfillment language with, uh, in verse, <coughs> excuse me, in verse, uh, in verse 15. Because what he said through the Lord, uh, this is what was fulfilled, what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. The reference is from uh, Hosea, uh, the prophet Hosea, which is up on the screen there for you. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. And this is kind of the full verse in context. So he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I call my son. Now, when we think of <clears throat> Egypt and Israel, we're meant to get transported back, so to speak, when the people of God were living in Egypt. Now, the people of God, when they lived in Egypt first, they first came to Egypt because at the time, you can read about there at, at the end of Genesis, there was a famine. There was a big famine. And so all at that point of God's descendants would go to and flee to Egypt. It was a place of at least at the time, a place of rescue, a place of safety, that sort of thing. But over time, uh, Israel grows in numbers and grows in influence. You can read about that in at the start of Exodus 1. And so the Pharaoh at the time uh, sees them as a giant threat, a huge threat to both himself and his own kingdom. And so what does he do? He enslaves them all. And God's people were basically under... Egyptian oppression for a long period of time. But even at the start of this story, we're meant to see God's providential hand at work in his son, protecting him, protecting his king with going down to Egypt. With the, Hosea, with the reference in Hosea, the, the reference to being a son, it's more of a it's not a particular person in mind, it's a collective son. It, it, it's God is painting himself as the father, the paternal, the father of his nation, the son of, of the Israel, his sons. The idea is that he is to love and he will protect them. And even in this earlier rescue, he's also mirroring, protecting his son, protecting the king. But then... The story kind of gets worse if we go back to Matthew 2. Because where we really encounter Herod's wickedness, uh, we see that in verse 16. Herod realizes he's been uh, duped, is kind of the idea. He's been outwitted, he's been tricked by the Magi, and he was furious. Kind of like, ears, uh, kind of like steam coming out of the ears, furious. Like crazy furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. This is absolutely horrible, isn't it? There's no sugarcoating it. This man is insanely jealous. He's paranoid that anyone two or under would, he would see as a threat to his own kingship. And actually, it echoes Pharaoh back in the day, back in Exodus, as the power and influence of the Israelites grow, that's what he does. He orders the killing of all these infant boys so they would no longer be a threat to him. But in verse 17, we read a second fulfillment taking place, even in the midst of this. We're told the prophet was for Jeremiah, was fulfilled, verse, eight, uh, verse 18. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and greatly mo great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. See, Matthew's telling us, again, something significant in this fulfillment. It comes from Jeremiah 31, verse 15. And we're kind of geographically speaking, uh, Rama is kind of like the place, it's like a port or like a stopping place for all of the Jewish people that were about to go into exile in Babylon. 
So like, this is bad. Why are we being reminded? If I was a Jewish person reading this, or even if I, if I knew about this, like, why am I being reminded about Rama? This is like bad news. This is, this is reminding Israel of the lowest, of the low point in their history. It was a horrible reminder of devastation that God's people had been conquered to be carried off to a foreign country because, yes, of their sin and their rebellion. We even have a, a really sad picture of Rachel who has been dead for some time at this point, but metaphorically she is weeping for her children, as the, for her children Israel, so to speak, as they get carried away. It's so distressing. There's a sense of loss. But even in the midst of this wickedness, well, we're left with the question, is there any hope? How does, how does Jesus, how does this work with Jesus? Well, we come back to the story because God is the one carrying Jesus, so to speak, yes, into Egypt, but then out of Egypt into a place of suffering. And you might say that sounds really odd. Why would God do that to his only son? Well, Jesus was being set up to see that Jesus is walking in the footsteps of his people for that prophecy to come in and out of Egypt in order to be set up that he might be the one to free his people combined with that first prophecy. In the midst of uncertainty and the devastation, God is saying that he has a bigger plan for this king that God will continue to redeem and rescue his people, but it's going to happen through Jesus. Even amidst this incredible suffering, there is even a provision of care by God for his king. And then we come back to the third, uh, because then we turn to our third part. We come back to the narrative and we see God's rescue again, this time going back to Israel. You see that in verse 19. After Herod dies, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. You see how that kind of mirrors at verse 13. God is the one doing the rescuing. He is doing the guiding. And so they get up, they take the child and his mother, they go to the land of Israel. But then we see another enemy. Yes, Herod is dead, but look who's there. Archelaus. Now that's, his, that's Herod's son. By all kind of historical accounts, he was worse than Herod. So however bad Herod was, this guy is even worse. And so, rightly so, Joseph's afraid and they withdraw. They withdraw in a dream. Uh, in a dream and having been warmed in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled or said through the prophet that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, there's, when we think about Nazareth, let, think about it like this. Uh, there's places in the world, maybe even in our own country. Uh, if, you're from, if you're from those places, people will treat you a certain way. Uh, sometimes, depending on if you say, I'm from place, insert place name here, uh, people will look at you with a kind of like, ooh. <laughs> Tell me more about that. Tell me more about that, that, that place where you grew up or where you currently live. Uh, by contrast, there's some places, if you say, I'm from, insert place here, it doesn't quite have the same effect. It's more like, huh? Never heard of that place. Or maybe I have heard of that place, but... Uh, why are you from that place? That sounds weird. Um, it doesn't quite have the same effect. And Nazareth was kind of like that place. Uh, in fact, uh, in God, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, two of Jesus' disciples tell uh, a man named Nathaniel that, hey, you know, the, you know the one that we've been looking for, that the prophets say uh, he's the Son of God? Yeah, we found him. And guess what? He's from Nazareth. And uh, Nathaniel, the guy he was, they were telling, he says this in a very sarcastic way. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's like, 
What are you talking about? You could hear the disdain dripping from his lips. You see, by all outward appearances in this story, uh, God seems to be stacking the deck against his own son. Uh, He's adding trial upon trial, suffering upon suffering, heartache and rejection. You know, maybe Jesus comes out at one end out of the frying pan, but it seems like the next moment he goes into the fire. But God's not doing this because he's cruel. In fact, remember that this father loves his son. The reason he does that is in the life of Jesus, in the way that Jesus' life is ordered, he's ordering the affairs of his son's life, that the final victory, the final victory over all things will be all the more glorious. See, God loves to work in this way. See, even Herod's wickedness, all the wickedness that he could throw, God's like, I'm going to use that to not just fulfill Scripture, but make my victory over you even more amazing. So as we close and think together, what might that be for us as we reflect at this part of the story in Matthew there's two things I'd like us to look at and on your, in your sermon outline on the right hand side you've got a blank page so that might be helpful for you uh, if you want to write some things down as we reflect together. The first is this, God's victory over sin comes through suffering. God's victory over sin comes through suffering. You, know, you might think that, that sounds kind of foreign to me or kind of unusual or uh, because, you know, isn't God meant to be just victorious no matter what? How does this work with Jesus, with what we've just read? Well, even God in this passage, God's victory over sin, is uniting, through Jesus, he unites his people because Jesus' life and victory comes through suffering. Because how he's been exiled Later on, and as we go through Matthew, we will continue to see, the, this is the early stage, but we'll continue to see his rejection even more. Yes, we wonder, maybe, is he the true king? But this is the pattern of the Messiah for us to know, that God himself is setting up for us. And when we think about this now, do you think of God as the one who is victorious in spite of, of suffering or actually through suffering because gee that's why Jesus came he came as a king but he came as not for kingly things he came to die through suffering to rise to give new life but unlike God's people who suffered in exile because of their sin and their rebellion by contrast Jesus suffered because he died, uh, because he perfectly was the Messiah. He died as the suffering Messiah, and that gives God incredible victory over sin and death for us. It's a beautiful picture of victory. And secondly for us, God, God will rescue us from this evil age. God will rescue us from this evil age. Uh, Consistently, through the history of all humanity, God never lets evil triumph over God's will. Remember, God, we remember here, yes, brings Israel out of of Egypt, out of slavery, yes. He He brings his people back after both exiles, He uses other nations, yes, to punish Israel who could continually sin and rebel. But in God's timing, those nations who would judge who would judge and persecute Israel would be judged for what they've done. Because God is not only the God who saves, He's the God who rescues us from judgment. 
He rescues us not only from judgment, but from the evil of this world. Because the new kingdom that Jesus is ushering in will face all kinds of opposition. All kinds of evil will be thrown at him as we go through Matthew. We'll see that more and more. But as God's people here this morning, we align ourselves with that king. With that new kingdom, which means that suffering king. That in a world that is characterized by evil, that when we stand with the king, we will face all kinds of oppositions, just as he did. The wonderful news is that God didn't only rescue us from the bondage of sin, that he himself will have the final victory and we will be a part of that. It's a promise to us, to his people, down through the ages, that God is the one who ultimately delivers his people. It's not us. It's not our own doing. And it is him and him alone. So as we've seen today, it's not this kind of victory from the ashes of defeat. That pales in comparison to the final victory of God through suffering in order to free us from the bondage of sin. And because we see here today that through his journey in and out of Egypt, God sets up Jesus as the one who will rescue his people from the bondage of sin. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. I thank you that in this story we see Jesus' journey from into and out of Egypt. We see how you setting, you're setting him up as the one who will rescue his people, not just from the bondage of slavery, but from the bondage of sin. Father, even Herod's great wickedness is even swallowed up in the victory that is yours. Father, we pray that as we reflect and consider today, let us be reminded of the victory that is entirely yours and that we are a part of. And Father, as we do suffer in the world, as we do face opposition for aligning ourselves with Jesus the King, I pray you will give us comfort and assurance that you will deliver us not just not, not only as, as you have done with us through your Son, but that you will deliver us from this evil age and we will rest in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.